Should we get started? Are we, uh, yeah? Yeah, let's do it. Um, okay. <clears throat> I'm trying to think of anything else. Uh, okay. Looks like Chris wanted to mention that Envoy Con is almost sold out. Buy your tickets. It's going to be awesome. Uh, do we do we know which maintainers are going? Are you going, Greg? Yeah, I'm going to be there. Great. Dan's cool. going to be going. Who? Dan. Dan, no. Dan no. Great. Dan, I think you're going to go, Harvey. Alyssa, obviously. Uh, I'm trying to think. Of, I, I, I'm not sure who else. All right, we'll, we'll try to get a... I'm going to start working on my slides probably for the... <clears throat> Um, for the last section, and I, I think I had talked to Richard from DataWire, and I think we had decided that it's mostly going to be like a like a structured Q and A. Um, but it'd be fun to figure out which maintainers are going to be there, and and like get some photos so that people know uh, like know who to go talk to after. So we can hopefully hopefully organize that. That'll be great. Awesome. Okay. Great. Harvey, did you want to talk about the event manager stuff? Yeah. And this is really just, I mean, it's probably, I don't think anything new is going to be said on this call. I just want to just raise general community awareness that right now I'm looking at event manager replacements for Envoy. This won't be an either or thing. The idea would be you could actually turn on alternative event managers such as LibUV or LibUV. The main motivation that I have is I would I think there are multiple motivations, actually. The first is uh, I would like better control over the loop to be able to gather better statistics. Live event doesn't really provide that. There's also performance aspects as you scale up to large number of events. And really, you're talking about like thousands or tens of thousands of active events when you start to see real differences, which might occur in scale up proxies, but mm, particularly with like, you know, let's like, like say lots of you know, idle connections, but it's, it's not something that most of the Envoy community will face. And I think the final one is just having a code base to work with, which is like live. I kind of feel both LibEvent and LibEV are ancient code bases, which are never updated. And people will make the argument, well, you know, what's what's new in the ePoll handling and nothing this has changed in the last five years. And that's probably true, but there's various, you know, small features like adding in hooks for special additional flags to control um, connection management, or which we have an, a, an open issue for, and also for, you know, these additional statistics, which would motivate us working on an active code base. In particular, I would like to work on a code base and adding features, if I am going to upstream them, that's going to actually make it to a point to release sometime soon. As we work with distributions who might want to, for example, dynamically link in system, but libraries such as their lib uh, ev or lib event or lib uv they're unlikely to want to work with um a patched version of that library or one which is at some random point in the uh, version control history so that's certainly the case for lib events today it's uh, has very infrequent releases and it's uh, uh, is, is very stable. LibEV is not much better. LibEV is actually, it's, it's canonical source control. I think it's CVS, which um, <laughs> it's been a long time since I've heard that word. And uh, uh, that, have, that alone, I think, would cross that off, off the list for me. I don't think I've used CVS in like tw 25 years. I, 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 don't, I, I don't even remember the last time. <laughs> Like, I have to admit, I was using it only 11 years ago, but that was on a code base that was itself a couple of decades. I mean, yeah. a decade uh -huh. old at that time. Okay. I mean, basically, LibUV is where all the cool kids are these days. Yeah. It's, LibUV is like LibEvent in that it does a lot more than we actually need it to do. But if we just take the, the event loop from that, at least we'll be on an active code base and uh, one which has shared fate with Node.js. So we know that at least one other pretty massive open source project uh, also considers it a key dependency. And we also have other nice overlap Node.js like, you know, NGHTP2 and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think my my two comments here are, um, I, I think it's worth doing some investigation, like just do, you know, like playing around, like hacking it up, like, because I think Greg had some comments that, you know, it, it might not be so easy. I just don't know. Um, yeah, I've I've done this before, and uh, and LibUV 
completely abstraction it, it, ah, abstracts the notion of a file descriptor. And so you mm. just have operations on an opaque thing. And so I think the code will have to change substantially. Uh, it might be a good change, but I don't think it's going to be trivial or straightforward. Also, the lifetime of everything anyway. worked around. I thought I thought that abstraction was uh, inevitable anyway. As it is. Maybe. Yeah, I agree. It is. Yeah, but yeah. I think it would be somewhat challenging to uh, be able to swap between like libev and libuv in the same code base. Like, it, you could do that, but you're building an abstraction layer so that you can use multiple abstraction layers and yeah. Uh, right. That was my other comment, which is that I personally think that if we do this, we should just change. So, yeah. so, so like, I, I'm not actually opposed to, to this investigation, but to me, um, I guess I'm of the camp that live event doesn't change because it's done. Uh, so, uh, and, and like, you but know, we, at the same time you suggesting we go in and we modify live events. No, 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 no. Yeah. Sorry. So, so like just, just for people out there to, to be aware of our private conversation, like I don't disagree with any of the things that you want to do. Like I, I wanted to do them also. Um, I would argue that they're likely very small changes to yes. live event. So I, I guess what I'm saying is this seems like a very worthwhile thing to explore, but I feel like we should do some investigation and like come back with like a little more of a firmed out proposal as to what it would look like. And then yeah. we can make an educated decision as to whether, okay, like let's just switch to live UV um, or do we want to like make some targeted patches to, to live event. And I suspect that again, like we can of course have a conversation of whether that's worthwhile for a point release or whether we'd have to fork or, or, or blah, but like knowing what I think we need to do, like these are very small hooks that we could add in like very small lines of code. I agree. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the nice thing about LibUV is it will pave the way to better Windows support in the long yep. term. And yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 So are you, so I, I, I guess to, to try to understand, like, are you committed to just like doing some hacking and then like coming back with like a little bit of a more informed proposal? Like, is that, is that what your plan is basically? Yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I was actually going to look at LibUV this afternoon. Uh, yeah, I, I was treating it as essentially something much closer to LibUV than what Greg tells me it is. Uh, Greg, do you know if you can actually get to the lower level, like, does it have a lower level library abstraction, which allows you to, uh, <laughs> You know, essentially stick with something closer to the libev model. Um, if you did such a thing, you wouldn't support Windows at all anymore. Uh, you're, you're, you, it really doesn't want you to do such a thing. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I, was, just, I was just curious. I mean, I, I assume you would still be able to support Windows in the same way that LibEvent supports Windows through a giant select loop or something, right? Or not? Um. You know, I'd have to look at whether it actually supports Windows because, you know, on Windows, the uh, the APIs for files versus sockets are completely different. You can't just, uh, you know, switch between them like you can on, on Unix systems. Uh, yeah. So it may or may not work at all if you kind of treat it as all file watchers. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll go in there and I'll take a look at... Uh... What, what needs to be done. I'm, I'm kind of wondering if there's going to be any low overlap between this and the ongoing work from um, the system. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, very, they're very yeah. likely will be, like not, not probably in V1 of the Cisco FD work, but I mean, I, I think eventually they are going to have to replace the event loop with DBDK or, or something similar. So, like the, there is parallel work here. It's just, it, it's hard for me without the, like you're going to do looking into the let, like the, the lib UV API. It's hard for me to understand what, like what this means. So yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like even if you were to go off and spend four hours and then just, and then just report back, like, I feel like that would give us a ton more information. Oh, I'll, I'll do that and I'll hopefully get some PR. I mean, yeah, we, but, but Basically, the API looks like you you create you know a connection like a stream connection, and then to do a write on it, you tell it I want to write, and you give it a completion callback, which may or may not be called back immediately. And the same thing for reads. So, yeah. Okay. yeah. That is a very different model. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, different. that's a, that's a better model in my opinion. So like, yeah. no, yeah, the I, IOCP model is right. I think it's superior. Yeah. Uh, me too. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I mean, this, this might be like the, the better long-term direction because it would support windows better. Um, it, it, like whether the library natively supports windows or not, we eventually would want to move windows over to using IO completion ports anyway. So this might make it easier. Um, but yeah, like per, per, per Greg, and again, without me knowing anything, I'm just, I'm worried that this is going to, it will turn into a large and probably scary project, which, which might be the right thing to do. Um, but it's, but it's definitely worth analyzing. Yeah. Also be very challenging to do this on the living patient while other people are making changes. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll, let me just go get some information and we can uh, think back. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, I was going to briefly talk about quick. Um, any, any, any other stuff that folks wanted to bring up? Hey, this is uh, Kyle LaRose. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I've been um, poking around with this uh, source transparency idea that uh, was submitted as an issue a while back and figured I could talk a bit about that. Sure, go for it. All right, um, so for those who don't know, um, we would like to have the ability to uh, connect to the upstreams with the original uh, source IP and maybe port um, that came into the system. Um, and you, we determine that either through uh, something like proxy protocol or just assume that what arrives at Envoy um, from the downstream is the correct uh, source of destination, sorry, source port and IP. Um, so to do that, uh, there's some, some work that needs to happen internally uh, in the connection pool so that we can actually reflect the, those IP, that information in the connection. Um, and we also need to do a bit of work to get that connection information into the connection pool. So we had a bit of a back and forth on this. I put up a design document um, and I think the approach we're going to take is to create a connection pool which wraps other connection pools and sort of handles um, a lot of the complexities of ensuring that the source board NIP uh, matches what came into the system. The biggest complexity being the fact that you can't just open a connection to the upstream and expect it to work. Um, you need to make sure that uh, any in incoming request maps to the correct upstream connection for its source IP and port, um, in case there's multiple requests in flight for a given connection. So um, I kind of been moving slowly on it uh, for the past bit. Uh, I've just been pretty busy with other things, but I'm hoping in the next uh, week to really sort of buckle down and, and get to work on it. Um, so we can have something to show soon. Um, anyway, if anyone has comments on that, uh, let me know. Yeah, if, if, if folks have not seen the design doc, it's super detailed, there's lots of comments on it, uh, it's, it's, it's worth reading. Um, I just, the one thing that I wanted to point out is that the reason that I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this work is that it won't just, it won't just solve source port. Uh, there's been like there's been repeated requests for other features like this, for example, to do routing to a, a host with like the same SNI information as was set from downstream. And this wrapped connection pool would also allow us to do things like that, which is nice. All right, that's all I have. Cool. Did anyone have any uh, questions or comments on that? Anyone have any uh, other things to bring up? Um, was somebody going to talk about it quick? Yeah, I, I was just I was just asking if anyone had any other. Did, oh, I did, attended stat memory reduction. Well, just, yeah, I was actually going to say, do you do do you want to talk briefly about our our email thread because I think it's interesting. Yeah. yeah um, so I kind of um, did this pattern where I just went hog wild in uh, something I'll never try to do a PR for to um, illuminate as much stat memory as possible, which I was able to cut like half of it at like, well, actually as background, there's cases where we are scaling Envoy to a surprising number of clusters, tens of thousands, maybe more. 
And in that scenario, like almost all the memory is stat names. <laughs> so um, that seems like not a great usage of memory. And most of those names are just uh, um, different combinations of the same strings put together in different ways. Um, so I've done kind of, I think most of what I can do along that line without doing the more radical thing of introducing a simple table. Um, and that's kind of in flight now. Um, along the way, I found various things that might make that work easier that Matt and I have been chatting about. One of them is to um, simplify or maybe even eliminate shared memory stats. Um, the elimination of it would be, uh, there would still be hot restart, but it would be involve um, having, you know, a transfer of control and a transfer of data from the old process to the new process. That was Matt's idea, actually. I haven't looked at that at all, other than to talk with him about it. Um, I also thought that it would simplify um, shared memory stats to not store the stat name at all in the shared memory, but instead store like a SHA hash and just use that for unifying uh, for deterministically unifying stat names, but with a fixed size, and that would eliminate a lot of complexity and reduce the amount of shared memory needed. But um, mostly what I'm looking at now is a flow where I can have this symbol table, all of the stat name memory held in a symbol table without taking lock in, a, in the hot path. That last part is the tricky one because the symbol table itself requires locks. So um, I think I have a solution to that, but I don't know if I have a solution to that that doesn't involve changing a whole bunch of lines of code. So that I'm kind of messing around with that now and trying to get something that's reviewable. Um, cool. Yeah, one, one thing just, just to throw out there, and this is something that I, I've been thinking about for, for a while, and I'm curious if people have thoughts on this, which is this whole topic of, there's been a bunch of work already done with like symbol table and other stuff. And the, so, you know, just, just for historical reasons, stats started out way simpler than they are now. Like things have gotten a lot more complicated. So some of the design decisions that we started with say three and a half years ago, um, they may not apply anymore. And one of those decisions I am becoming increasingly convinced is not worth it anymore is to keep the stats themselves in shared memory. And, and very roughly, the way that I think that would work is we would move each process individually over to symbol table, like it would be able to do heap and minimize memory as much as possible. And then in the hot restart protocol, we would actually have some type of pagination API where the new process can just ask the old process, give me all your counter and gauge values, right? And it would do that until the old process shuts down. So say every flush interval, like every five seconds, every 60 seconds, the new process would say to the old process, hey, like give me all your stats. The old process would start sending RPC frames to the new process with some blocks of stats. And then the new process would basically, when it outputs stats, it would add the old processes, counters, and gauges to the new processes, counters, and gauges. So, you know, it's not going to be as real time or as accurate, but to be honest, I think it will work perfectly well and people won't even know the difference. And I think if we did that, it will simplify so much. Like we can get rid of all the truncation stuff. Like we can start using the same code path for, for like symbol tables. So, and again, just for historical context, the reason that I didn't do that way, way back in the day is that things used to be way, way simpler. So like shoving the stats in shared memory was a lot simpler than writing this pagination thing. But now writing the pagination thing seems trivial compared to all of the other work that we're doing. So, um, so you know, that's my current thinking is actually that we should rip stats out of shared memory. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious if people have any thoughts on that. I think that's worth investigating. Uh, it sounds it sounds like a, a good change if we can pull it off. I'm curious yeah. how it'll scale with large numbers of stats and you know how much data we have to send between the processes and yeah. how much CPU time that consumes. Right. Yeah. I mean, my I on the order of a hundred a hundred stats per cluster, and each one takes a hundred bytes. But it's only the gauges that need this sort of real time responsiveness, right? 
so so yeah i mean and like as as part of this we could we could rethink a bunch of things um i'd say gauges are the most important thing right like you could argue that we could just do this for gauges mm -hmm. in a perfect world you would have counters too because the old process is still doing things right so like it would be nice to be able to add both of the things that the old process is doing like closing connections draining connections etc um but I, I do agree that as if we go down this road, I think we could have a larger conversation of like what, what is the optimal way of, of doing this. And I, I do think that it is a coherent argument to say that, well, it's too much work if we do counters and gauges, there's way fewer gauges, like let's just do gauges. Um, but I do think like, I guess the optimal solution would continue to send counters and gauges. Um, so I, like, I guess my opinion would be, let's start there. If it looks like per Greg that it's using too much CPU or like something like that, um, you know, like we, we, we uh, we could back it off, but my okay. gut, well, as you say, just real quick, my, my gut tells me that it won't be an issue because if we only send the data from the old process to the new process, every like 30 seconds, I, I just don't see it being a big deal. Right. And if it's only the Delta rights, you, yep. uh, it'll be much smaller. Like even if you have like 10,000 clusters, you may only be actively using yes. 50 of them. During yes, the right. We would, we would only send like, we already keep track of what stats have been quote used. So it's like, we would only send used stats. So I, I think the number of stats that we send would be small. Yeah. Well, um, I wonder if you could actually, rather than developing a new API, almost somehow make use of new processes as a stat sync for the old one. I haven't quite thought that through. Yeah, 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 actually maybe. Um, that, that, is, that is worth thinking about for sure. Um, it'll be a little tricky because, you know, when you send stats and when you request them is a hot restart implementation detail because the new process is shutting down the old process. So there might be some timing issues. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, this, this might be the opportunity that we've looked for also to change the, the RPC API to using protos. So it's like, I, I mean, there, there are some real benefits here that might, that we might want to invest in this. So I guess, I, I mean, I'm not sure if you're up for it, Joshua, but I mean, it might be worth it to at least open an issue, like listing out some of these options. Um, and, and then we can talk about it from there. But I, I, the, the more that I think about it, the more that I think we should just rip it out. That's cool. I, I will say that um, that has a bunch of benefits, which you've talked about. Um, the existence of the hot restart path and the alternate way of allocating stat memory is not really getting in my way at all. Okay. All right. Because I managed to find kind of the right <clears throat> points to virtualize that. And I feel like um, that's not really making my life. Even the truncation is not really a big deal. But, uh, but I understand there's a bunch of benefits to this and it sounds more portable and well, uh, yeah, it, it just seems like I feel like as this code has gotten more and more complicated, I feel like this would actually allow us to vastly simplify it and make it easier to understand again, right? Whereas now, like with the different code paths, with the heap allocator and the shared allocator, it's like, it's so complicated. Uh, it's yeah. very, very hard to wrap one's head around it. Now. Yeah, That's I fair. agree. I'm, I'm deep in it, so I, I get it, but I understand that's definitely harder to understand. Okay, are you... Are you willing to potentially open an, an issue though on this whole conversation okay. and, and then we can decide, like we'll, we'll, we'll find someone to look into it. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm gonna have time to dig into that, but I definitely, I'll, sure I'll open the issue and I'll try to record the stuff that we discussed already. Okay, great, yeah. If it turns out that you don't have time to open the issue, let me know and I can do it. I, I can do that. Great, um, awesome. Uh, so it's just in like, Three minutes about quick. I sent some emails to the list. Um, we're we're going to be kicking off a cross company effort to get quick going. Um, so just check out the emails that I've sent if you're interested in, in quick. I think over the next couple of months, we'll increasingly be looking for some help. Uh, right now, I, I don't think there's as much to do, but there'll be more to do soon. Uh, once some of the initial UDP stuff lands, once some of the uh, VPP FD uh, refactors land uh, and, and some of the Google work. So that'll be great. Cool.
Uh, anyone else have anything uh, that they wanted to bring up? Uh, just out of curiosity, what's the rough model for mapping UDP onto Envoy's, you know, worker model? Do you receive every packet and then forward it to what you calculate is the correct worker? Yeah, exactly. So the way that we've been thinking about this is that um, in newer kernels with UDP, if you use, I think, S SO reuse port, um, I think the kernel will actually hash. Um, so forwarding wouldn't necessarily be necessary. Like it should, oh, nice. it should wind awesome. up at the right place. Like that's, that's how Google does it at scale. Um, so I, like, I don't, in the common case, I don't think that there will, there will have to be cross worker sense. It should just work. Okay, but we'll have a fallback path for yeah, right, that right. won't do that or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, so we'll have yeah. to keep track of, of the map and then basically send, send packets over. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? I had a quick question on uh, when we were deprecating some of the TCP stuff, we had uh, kind of a blocker with the source IPs not being implemented fully in v2 uh, for filter matching yep. uh, and then, then there's kind of another parallel pr for adding a source type which seemed like it was potentially also going to do this i had kind of a parallel pr to add source ip and source ports but then we decided source ports is probably something you want to deprecate entirely does anyone have any more follow-up on if that source type pr is something that we should just Kind of keep I, my I, I, I've forgotten and, where we actually ended up going with that. It may have just been sitting there and it's gone <coughs> to scale. The yeah, problem really wondering. there was that it was an incomplete solution. Like it was definitely an interesting feature which you couldn't emulate with the existing um, matches. This idea of trying to make sure to, to, to determine whether an incoming IP was essentially coming from the local host or not. Uh, but the, yeah, the, the claim was, I, I'm being kicked out, so that you could do that just by trying to match uh, IP addresses was not really complete for more complex systems. So my take was that it was fine to add what they were after, but they needed to <clears throat> rephrase what it actually was doing versus, versus claiming there was matching from the same host to at least, you know, essentially just same IP. So yeah, but anyway, I, I'm being outside. I can continue this online. Yeah, let's let's attempt to find some resolution to that. So maybe Christopher, if you could ping those PRs, we could figure it out. Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.